talking about salvation. I think there's a great deal of truth in the statement that either you're saved or you ain't. And the best thing to do about it is find out which and stick to it. What counts most is personal satisfaction. At least most people. God knows you'll never get that by straining and struggling for something which you're just not cut out for. Now, <clears throat> I passed through a period in my life in which I struggled. One evening while Gypsy Smith was preaching around this section, I dropped in there and heard this wonderful sermon on spiritual struggle. It started me thinking about the lustful body and how I ought to put up a struggle against it. And the struggle I did for quite a while after that. Chances are it might have still been going on if Lot hadn't brought that woman back with him from Memphis. Showed me just how useless the whole thing was, as far as I personally was concerned, anyhow. Now, Lot came home from Memphis one Saturday morning last summer and brought this woman back with him. I was working out in the south field spraying the damned army worms, when I seen the Chevy come turning in off the highway onto the drive. I went to the house to meet him. Lot was drunk. This is my wife, he said. Her name is Myrtle. I didn't say a word to him. I just stood and looked her over. She had on a two-piece thing, the skirt part wide and the top of it blue polka dotted, hung on kind of crooked, showed part of her tits. <laughs> Biggest I'd ever seen on a young woman's body. Sunburned halfway down to the nipples underneath, pure white and pearly looking. Well, she said, hello, brother made like she would kiss me, but I turned away in disgust because I wanted her to know how I felt about it. It's a real bitch trick marrying a dying man, which she must have known Lot was. Lot was a TB case, and he had it so bad they had to let the air out of one of his lungs back in Memphis. I guess she must have known what the setup was. The place was Lot's and not mine, even though I did all the work on it. After Dad died and I learned how I'd been fucked, I quit the place and went to Meridian to work in the stave mill there. But I, I got these uh, pitiful letters from Lot saying, please come back, and I did with the understanding that when Lot died, which is bound to be pretty soon, the place would be mine. Well, I thought to myself after meeting this woman, the sensible thing to do is just lay low, see how things work out. So I went back to the field and continued my spraying. I didn't come in for supper. Went to the crossroads in to drink me some beer. Must have been about a half past ten when I come back to the house. Lamp was on in the kitchen. I, she was in there heating up something or other on the stove. I didn't like to let on I even noticed her presence. I walked right past her and on up to the attic, pushed my cot in the gable to get the breeze, but there wasn't a breath of it stirring. I thought things over, but I didn't decide nothing yet. Long toward morning, I started to hear some noise. Went downstairs barefoot. Bedroom door was open and they was in there panting like two hound dogs. Damn. <laughs> I went outside around the fields till it was sun up, and then I went back to the house. The black girl, Clara, was there to fix breakfast, and uh, after a while, the woman came into the kitchen. She had on a light blue satin kimono, but she didn't bother to fasten around her even. Now Clara kept looking at me and giggling when she set my plate down. And she said, what are you looking at? I said, nothing much. <laughs> and she let out a laugh like a horse. 
I could blame her. Me saying nothing much about them two huge knockers. <laughs> when breakfast was over, I called Lot out on the porch for a little talk. Now look here, I said. I overheard you last night in the room with that woman. How long do you think you'll last in your condition? Inside of a month, that lovely Miss Myrtle will fuck the last breath from your body and go on back to the Memphis cat house. You must have got her out all fresh as a daisy. Well, that speech of mine made him sore, and he acted like he was going to take a sock at me, but I got mine in first. <laughs> I knocked him back off the steps. Then she come out, she called me a dirty prick and uh, lots of other nice things like that, and then she started a crying. You don't understand, she bawled. <laughs> I love him and he loves me. I laughed in her face. Last winter, I told her, he took the sheets himself. What do you mean, she asked me. Ask a lot, I told her. Then I walked off and let him chew that over. Ha! I went off laughing. The sun was up good then and hot as blazes. I had my jug of liquor stashed in a clump of snow on the mountain. I went out to it and took a pretty good drink. It made me drunk right off. I drunk a pretty good deal the night before. The ground kept tilting up and down like a steamboat. When it was dark, I went up to the house. The lights was turned out, so I turned on a lamp in the kitchen and warmed up supper. There was some coffee left in the pot on the stove. I drunk it black, against my better judgment. Keeps me from sleeping in summer, especially when I'm horny from not getting much. And uh, <laughs> been six weeks since I laid a woman. I thought to myself, I'm 25 and strong. I, I, Damn, I, I got to quit fooling around and get me a girl to go steady with. The air in the kitchen was hot and it seemed to be humming. I guess my blood was kind of overheated. My hand fell down in my lap between my legs. My head was tired and almost before I'd known what I was doing, I had it out and started playing with it. <laughs> oh, I don't want that. I, I don't want that, I said. I, so I got up quick and went around to the big rain barrel out back and I'd thrown water on my face and over my body. But the water only seemed to make it stiffer. <laughs> Showed no signs of going back down either. Two hands barely covered it. So I sat down there beside the rain barrel and jerked my Peter. <laughs> Moon was out and why is a blonde girl's head? There was no wind. There wasn't a breath of air stirring. I looked upstairs. The lamp was on in their bedroom. I listened a while and I could hear him. Grunting like a pair of pigs in the sty. Yeah. They was at it again. I thought of her legs. Soft as silk without a dark hair on them. And her titties. Biggest I'd ever seen on a young woman's body. <laughs> and of her belly, round and bulging out. And it sure would be good to press up against it or get her body turned over and up on the knees a little and then climb on and stick it up and under. Good, good, good. It's the best thing in the world, that burning sensation. And then the running over, the sweet relaxing and letting go shot off inside her, leaving you weak and ready for sleep. Yeah, there's nothing like it in all the world. Nothing able to compare with it even. Just that thing and nothing more is perfect. The rest is shit. <laughs> all of the rest is nothing hardly but shit. But that thing's good. And if you never had 
nothing else but that. No money, no property, no success in the world, but still that, that, why that would still make it worth living for you. Yeah, you could, come, you could come home to a house with a tin roof on it and blaze in the heat and look for water, not find a drop to drink. And look for food and not find a single crumb in it. But if on the bed you had a naked woman, maybe not even terribly young or good looking, <laughs> she looked up and said, I want it, Daddy. <laughs> Why then, I say you got a square deal out of life, and anybody that don't think so just ain't fucked the right woman. <laughs> but that sort of thinking was doing me no good at all. <laughs> so I, I went back to the kitchen and filled and lit my pipe. I looked at the sink with the dishes all piled up in it. You know, a lot of improvement this... Uh, Myrtle had made on the place. But then she wanted a woman. A woman's a woman, but a cunt is a cunt. And that's what this Myrtle was. She was a cheap piece of tail. You know, I could use on there word in the dad about that, but if I brought home one to live with, by God, it would have to be one that I was able to feel a little respect for. I went to the screen door to pee. I had to wait several minutes before I could. <laughs> Long way off, I heard a hound dog baying. It sounded sad. In spite of myself, I, I went back to my old train of thoughts. It just seemed like my mind was set on the subject. Nothing would stop it. It's like the preacher says. The gates of the soul has got to close on the body, keep the body out, or the body will break them down and overrun the soul and everything else decent in you. In fact, the matter is, though, I never did seem to have any gates to close. Now, I was made without them. Some people are, I guess. I'd say to myself, this sort of thing is dirty. And I remember what the preacher had said about closing the gates on the soul struggling, and I'd reach for the gates to close them and find I had nothing to catch a hold of. I guess my trouble was partly a lack of schooling. I'd never think of anything much to do but drinking and screwing and doing my damnedest to make something out of the place but not having much luck at it. I guess if a fellow could pick up a book at night, that ought to make a great deal of difference in it. Oh, I could read. I, I could make the most out of the words. But dog, if reading would close the gates on the body. Made up stuff is just not satisfying to me. Poker I like to play, but I always seem to come out a little at the end of the horn. I like to go into town and look at a movie or a carnival show. But only ever so often. Looking at them screen stars don't close the gates on the body I don't ever think that it does there's nothing makes a fellow quite so horny as sitting there in the dark and looking at them beautiful actresses messing around in a little lace steppings or a fancy wrapper you come back out and there ain't one inch of the soul that ain't overrun by the longings of the body well I was still in the kitchen while the night wore away, but I had a feeling that something was going to happen before the night ended, and I was not mistaken. It must have been about a half past twelve when all of a sudden a big commotion begins. I heard him coughing and then her running and shouting my name in the hall. I just sat tight there, waiting to see what would happen. After a while, she'd come on down to the kitchen to fill up the water pitcher. Didn't you hear my calling, you chicken? She says. I just sat there and looked at her. She filled up the water pitcher and clumped it down on the table. Lots took sick, she told me. I didn't say nothing. He, he seems to be awful sick. I, 
I wanted to call the doctor, but he said no, no, no. He, he'd be all right in the morning. I didn't say a thing to her. What's wrong with him? She asked me after a while. He's got TB, I told her. She put on a shocked expression. <laughs> How bad is it? She asked me. I told her they'd let the air out of one of his lungs at the Memphis hospital because the x-rays had shown it was all eaten up with disease. <laughs> Why didn't somebody tell me? She asked. She sat there and whimpered a little and I said nothing, but I just kept on looking at her. I've had a bad time. She told me, you, you, you don't understand how, how it is with, with a woman like me. I used to work in a dry goods store in Biloxi. What, you planning to give me your life story? <laughs> no, 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 she said. I just wanted to tell you something. Then I was thin and I hadn't dyed my hair and I looked real pretty. I was 15 then and I didn't go out with the boys I was just as nice as any girl you could think of. But y you can imagine what happened. The man managed the store, kept, kept walking by me, and every time he did, he would touch my body. F first on my arm, and, and then on my shoulder, and finally on my, on my hips. I told my girlfriend about it. Honey, she said, just take him aside and have a sincere conversation. <laughs> you tell him you're not used to that sort of treatment. So that's what I done. I went to his office at the back of the store. It was late one Saturday in the middle of summer. I said, <laughs> Mr. Porter, you seem to be taking advantage of the fact that you're my boss to take some liberties with me, which I don't like because of my decent upbringing. But Charlie just grinned. He walked up to me and he put his hands on my hips. Is this what you mean? He said. And then he kissed me. And then it was all over with me. I, I, I tried to walk one way and Charlie pushed me the other. He kicked the office door shut and backed me up against the big roller top desk and he took me by force right there. He had my cherry right there on that roller top desk. He was a man about 40 with sandy red hair. You know the sort, like, like a, a great big bull and I fell in love with him I got to admit he made me so happy that summer and my memories of it are still the best that I've got <laughs> they say you always lose your heart with your cherry well I, I don't know about that some girls don't like it at first but I got to admit that from the beginning I loved it She wiped her eyes on the edge of the tablecloth. Is that the end of the story? <laughs> no, she said. It was only beginning. He, he got tired of me. Some girls, they'd have made trouble. I could have because I was only 15 at the time, but I had too much pride. So I, I packed up and moved to Pensacola, then to New Orleans, and finally I come to Memphis. I picked up Lot on the street. He looked like a kid. Sort of thin and pitiful looking. It, it, it touched me that he laid on me like a baby. He, he, he seemed so lonesome. And it's the truth that I loved him. He slept in my arms just like a baby would. And when he woke up, he, he said, would I come home with him? And, 
we'd be married. At first I laughed, but then I thought, oh, oh, oh well, as the fellow says, that th there's a hell of a lot more to it, this business of sex, than a couple of people jumping up and down on each other's eggs. <laughs> so, so, so I said, yeah. When we set out next morning, Now, now what shall I do? She asked. Do about what? I asked her. You? She said. The minute I laid eyes on you, the first glance I'd look at that big, powerful body, I, I said to myself, uh-oh, you're goose is cooked, <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> what shall I do about it? Well, I said, when somebody's goose is cooked, the best way to have it cooked is with plenty of gravy. <laughs> I picked up the lamp off the table and started up the stairs. She followed on behind me. At the door of Lot's room, she stopped by and I kept going. I went on up to the attic and dropped my clothes on the floor beside the cot and sat down on it and waited for her to come up, which I known she would do. I don't think I ever in all my life looked forward to anything so much as I did to that woman coming up to bed with me. It went five minutes before I heard footsteps on the stairs coming up to the attic and then I realized I'd been praying. I'd been sitting there praying to God to send that woman up to me. <clears throat> What'd you make of that? What sort of God would pay attention to prayer like that coming from someone like me who was sold to the devil when thousands of good people's prayers Prayers for the sick and the suffering and dying are given no mind. No more than so many crickets buzzing in the summer. But that is beside the point now. Point is, Lot's wife is coming up to bed with me. And when I heard her coming, it stood straight up. You could hang your hat on it. <laughs> I spread my legs and she come toward me and stopped beside the cot and stroked it and kissed it like it was something holy. She giggled and crooned and carried on like something outlandish. I just lay back and looked at the sky. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Finally, she wiggled up and got on the cot beside me. I felt of her body so big and hot like a mountain that had a furnace inside it. I ripped the drawers off her bottom and then I climbed on. She put the head of it in. I give a push and she yelled out, God Almighty! I drew it back and gave it another shove and she said, Oh, blessed Mary! She said her prayers all the time. I was giving it to her and when I come, she did it the same time. I swear her yelling nearly took the roof off. Oh, blessed Mary, mother of God! She shouted. I had to laugh. And he must have heard her downstairs because it was about that time he started bawling out our names. Now, even before I come downstairs in the morning, I known Lot was dead. And sure enough, he was. He'd gotten out of bed and crawled on the floor as far as the door to the bedroom. His body was stretched out halfway over the sill and the blood, it was now dried in the hot yellow sunlight, had made a stream from the foot of the bed to where his head was resting. I wasn't surprised. Because all that live long night, we'd heard him bawling out, Murder! 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 Later on, I heard him calling my name out. Chicken! Ch chicken! Chicken! 
once or twice, she said in a half-hearted kind of way, I, I, I reckon I better go down and, and make him hush that godforsaken ball. And, but I said, no, balling's good for his lungs. <laughs> so we kept right on having our fun up in the attic. Balling quit by and by, a little while after sunup, and then it was quiet, and I thought to myself, Lot's dead. I called the Myrtle and she come downstairs too. We stood together in front of the door and looked at him. <laughs> Poor little kid, said Myrtle. She started to cry, but not very much or for long. <laughs> it's all for the best, I told her. And after a while, she said she guessed it was, too. <coughs> we got hitched up that winter. We have our troubles, but we get on pretty good. As good as most young couples do in the country. We're expecting a baby about the end of the summer. If it's a boy, we aim to call him Lot in memory of my brother. And if it's a girl, I guess we'll call her Lottie. <laughs> and now it seems like everything in my life is straightened out. And I don't ever worry about them spiritual gates the preacher told me to keep shut. Not having no gates can save you a lot of trouble. And after all, what does anyone know about the kingdom of heaven? It's earth I'm after. And now I'm honest about it and don't pretend I'm nothing but what I am. A lustful creature determined on satisfaction. And likely is not to get my full share of it.